Hello, guys. Today I'm reading chapter three from the book What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20 by Tina Selig. And um, I thought it would be nice to, uh, to relate a little bit uh, to the chapter and what it is about. That's why I was looking for a place uh, um, that's quite unusual. I think I found it. I was successful. Okay, I hope you enjoy. This is Bikini or Die. The famous psychologist B.F. Skinner once wrote that all human behavior can be viewed as being adaptive to either the individual, the gene pool, or to society at large. However, these three forces are often at odds, causing significant tension. The rules made by society are a huge presence in our lives created by the government, religious groups, or employers, our schools, our neighbors, and our families. Because these social groups craft the explicit rules around us, we often find ourselves in situations where, I, where we are driven to break them to satisfy our personal desires or the drives of our species. These social rules and norms are designed to make the world around us more organized and predictable and to prevent us from hurting one another. But when is a rule really just a suggestion? And when do suggestions morph into rules? Every day, physical signs tell all of us what to do, written instructions direct us how to behave, and social guidelines urge us to act within specific parameters. In fact, we also make lots of rules for ourselves, in large part encouraged by others. These rules become woven into our individual fabric as we go through life. We draw imaginary lines around what we think we can do, lines that often limit us much more than the rules imposed by society at large. We define ourselves by our professions, our income, where we live, the car we drive, our education, and even by our horoscope. Each definition locks us into specific assumptions about who we are and what we can do. I'm reminded of a famous line from the movie My Dinner with Andre that states that New Yorkers are both guards and prisoners and as a result they no longer have the capacity to leave the prison they have made or even see it as a prison. We always make our own prisons with rules that we each create for ourselves, locking us into specific roles and out of an endless array of possibilities. What if you challenge the underlying assumptions? What are the consequences, good and bad, of getting off the prescribed path? What happens to those who break the rules? Larry Page, co-founder of Google, gave a lecture on which he encouraged the audience to break free from established guidelines by having a healthy disregard for the impossible. That is, to think as big as possible. He noted that it is often easier to have big goals than to have small goals. With small goals, there are very specific ways to reach them and more ways they can go wrong. With big goals, you are usually allocated more resources and there are more ways to achieve them. This is an in interesting insight. Imagine that you are trying to get from San Francisco to Kabul. There are lots of different routes. You will likely give yourself the time and resources to get there and you'll be flexible if things don't unfold as planned. But if your goal is to go across town, then the path is pretty clear and you expect it to be a quick trip. If the road is blocked for some reason, you are stuck and frustrated. One of the reasons Google has been so successful is their willingness to tackle hard problems with an undefined path to completion. Linda Rottenberg is a prime example of a person who sees no problem as too big to tackle and readily breaks free of expectations in order to get where she wants to go. She believes that if others think your ideas are crazy, then you must be on the right track. Eleven years ago, Linda started a remarkable organization called Endeavor. Their goal is to foster entrepreneurship in the developing world. 
she launched Endeavor just after graduating from Yale Law School with little more than a passion to stimulate economic development in disadvantaged regions. She stopped at nothing to reach her goals, including stalking influential business leaders whose support she needed. Endeavor began its efforts in Latin America and has since expanded to other regions of the world, including Turkey and South Africa. They go through a rigorous process to identify high potential entrepreneurs and, after selecting those with great ideas and the drive to execute their plan, give them the resources they need to be successful. The entrepreneurs are not handed money, but instead are introduced to those in their environment who can guide them. They are also provided with intense educational programs and get an opportunity to meet with uh, other entrepreneurs in their region who have navigated the circuitous path before. Once, success once successful, they serve as positive role models, create jobs in their local communities, and eventually give back to Endeavor, helping future generations of entrepreneurs. An inspiring example of an Endeavor entrepreneur is Leila Vélez in Brazil. Leila lived in the slums in the hills overlooking Rio de Janeiro, known as favelas. Cleaning houses, she survived on a subsidence income. However, she had an idea. There are many women in Brazil who want desperately to have softer, less kinky hair. Leila, along with her sister-in-law, Heloisa Assis, invented a product that transforms knotty hair into curly hair. It took years of trial and error experimentation, resulting in many extreme failures along the way, but once she found a solution, she opened a, sa a salon in Rio. Her business was brisk, and Leila had the fantasy of creating a franchise. This business, called Beleza Natural, now employs a thousand people and earns millions in annual revenue. This is but one of hundreds of success stories from Endeavor. I was at Endeavor's biannual summit two years ago and was overwhelmed with the energy and enthusiasm in the room. Each entrepreneur was indebted to Endeavor for providing the tools they needed as well as the inspiration to succeed. This would never have happened if Linda had listened to those who told her that her, her, idea, her ideas were crazy. One of the biggest obstacles to taking in on impossible tasks is that others are often quick to tell you they can't be accomplished. It is arguably tough to address a grand problem, but once you decide to take it on, it is equally hard to break out of traditional approaches to solving it. This is another place where it is helpful to break a few rules. The next exercise forces people to do this in a surprising way. First, come up with a problem that is relevant for the particular group. For example, if it is a group of executives in the utility business, the topic might be getting companies to save energy. If it is a theater group, the, th the problem might be how to attract a larger audience. And if it is a group of business students, the challenge might be to come up with a cool new business idea. Break the group into small teams and ask each one to come up with the best idea and the worst idea for solving the stated problem. The best idea is something that each team thinks will solve the problem brilliantly. The worst idea will be ineffective, unprofitable, or will make the problem worse. Once they are done, they write each of their ideas on a separate piece of paper, one labeled best and one labeled worst. When I do this exercise, I ask participants to pass both to me and I proceed to shred the best ideas. After the time they spent generating these great ideas, they are both surprised and not too happy. I then redistribute the worst ideas. Each team now has an idea that another team thought was terrible. They are instructed to turn this bad idea into a fabulous idea. They look at the horrible idea that was passed their way and quickly see that it really isn't so bad after all. In fact, they often think it is terrific. Within a few seconds, someone always says, hey, this is a great idea. When doing this exercise with the utility company, one of the worst ideas for saving energy was to give each employee a quota for how much energy he or she used and to charge extra 
for exceeding the allotment. They thought it was a pretty silly idea. The team that received this idea turned it into an idea that is really worth considering in which employees do have a quota for how much energy they use. If they use less, they get money back. And if they use more, they are charged for it. They could even sell energy credits to their co-workers, giving them, them an even larger incentive to save electricity. I did this exercise with the staff responsible for putting on arts events at Stanford. One of them, uh, one of the teams charged with finding ways to bring in a larger audience came up with the bad idea of putting on a staff talent show. This is seemingly the opposite of what they do now, bringing in top-notch talent from around the world. The next team turned this idea upside down. They interpreted this much more broadly and proposed a big fundraiser where the faculty and staff across the university would showcase their diverse talents. This would very likely bring in lots of people who don't normally go to performing arts events and would help build awareness for their other programs. When the challenge was to come up with the worst business idea, the suggestions were boundless. One group suggested selling bikinis in Antarctica. One recommended starting a restaurant that sells cockroach sushi. And one group proposed starting a heart attack museum. In each of these cases, these bad ideas were transformed into pretty interesting ideas that deserve some real consideration. For example, the group that was, asked, was tasked with selling bikinis in Antarctica came up with the slogan, Bikini or Die. Their idea was to take people who wanted to get into shape on a trip to Antarctica. To Antarctica. By the end of the hard journey, they would be able to fit into their bikinis. The group that needed to sell cockroach sushi came up with a restaurant called La Cucaracha that made all sorts of exotic sushi using non-traditional but nutritious ingredients and tar targeted adventurous diners. The group, given the challenge of starting a heart attack museum, used this idea as the starting point for a museum devoted entirely to health and preventative medicine. All groups came up with compelling business names, slogans, and commercials for these ventures. This exercise is a great way to open your mind to solutions to problems because it demonstrates that most ideas even if they look silly or stupid on the surface, often have at least a seed of potential. It helps to challenge the assumption that ideas are either good or bad and demonstrates that with the right frame of mind, you can look at most ideas or situations and find something valuable. For example, even if you don't start the bikini or dye excursion to Antarctica, it is an interesting starting point for ideas that might be more practical. My old buddy, John Stiegelbaut, used the idea of turning a good idea on its head when applying to graduate school. He did something that any normal person would think was a terribly bad idea, and it turned out to be inspired. He decided at the last minute that he wanted to go to business school. Having missed all the deadlines, he chose to make his application stand out among the others in an unconventional way. Instead of touting his impressive accomplishments, he as most applicants do, he augmented his traditional application with a letter of reference written by a past professor claiming to be John's best friend and cellmate in prison. The letter described John in the most unusual terms that any admissions committee had ever seen, including his ability to open a mason jar with his belt. Instead of knocking John out of the running, those in the admissions office were incredibly curious to meet him and invited John to visit the school. John was nice enough to dig up the letter so you can see it too. Here's the letter. To whom this may concern. I met John Stiegelbaut as a fellow Greyhound bus passenger. He must have passed out on the floor at the back. I found him next to a styrofoam cup and a candy wrapper covered with cigarette butts holding an empty MD-2020 bottle. I am his best friend. We were cellmates after we got caught robbing the 7-Eleven. 
After a hearty meal at the Salvation at the Salvation Army, we once went to a, a revival meeting where we were both trying to pick up the same girl. He takes defeat and humiliation well. He is obviously a practiced loser. Junior Achievement Company or Small Family Laundry could put to good use. He covers his brown and yellow teeth when he yawns and opens the window when he spits. He can whistle loud using his fingers and can crack a mason jar with his burp. He showers once a month. He uses soap when he can. He needs a place so he doesn't have to sleep in the bus station restroom. He needs to find a position with a large company where his heavy drinking and sexual preference for exotic birds will not get him fired the first day on the job. Anyone with a sexual preference for exotic birds is both original and independent of thought. In fact, he is so independent of thought that he is utterly devoid of it. This guy will do anything for a drink. He may even work. Now that Styx is out of jail, I'm sure his parole officer would not mind if some graduate school looked after him for a bit. He's a great leader in the Hells Angels, and all the boys I talked to thought he would make a hell of a white-collar criminal. Of all the people I have found on the floor, passed out in the back of a bus, this guy is the best. My overall impression is that he's not as good as I make him out to be. Get me out of jail so I can go to Chicago instead of him. Once John arrived for the interview, everyone in the office was peeking out of his or her doors, hoping to get a look at the fellow who submitted the wild application. He was polite and poised during his interview, and he was admitted to Harvard. The concept that there are no bad ideas as a hallmark of good brainstorming. During a brainstorming session, it is important to explicitly state that there are no bad ideas. You need to break with the assumption that ideas need to be feasible in order to be valuable. By encouraging people to come up with wild ideas, you diffuse the tendency to edit your ideas before you share them. Sometimes the craziest ideas which seem impractical when they are initially proposed turn out to be the most interesting in the long run. They might not work in their first iteration, but with a bit of massaging, they might turn out to be brilliant solutions that are feasible to implement. Running a successful brainstorming session actually takes a lot of skill and practice. The key is to set the ground rules at the beginning and to reinforce them. Tom Kelly, general manager of the design firm IDEO and David Kelly's brother, wrote a book called The Art of Innovation, in which he describes the rules of brainstorming at their firm. One of the most important rules is to expand upon the ideas of others. With this approach, at the end of a good brainstorming session, multiple people feel that they created or contributed to the best ideas to come out of the session. And since everyone in the room had a chance to participate and witness the emergency and uh, evolution of all the ideas, there is usually shared support for the ideas that go forward toward implementation. If you have participated in brainstorming sessions, you know that they don't always work like that. It is hard to eliminate the natural tendency for each person to feel personal ownership for their ideas, and it can be tough to get participants to build on others' suggestions. Patricia Ryan Madsen, who wrote Improv Wisdom, designed a great warm-up exercise that brings to life these two ideas. There are no bad ideas and Build on others' ideas. You break a group into pairs. One person tries to plan a party and makes suggestions to the other person. The other person has to say no to every idea and must give a reason why it won't work. For example, the first person might say, let's plan a party for Saturday night. And the second person would say, no, I have to wash my hair. This goes on for a few minutes. As the first person continues to get more and more frustrated trying to come up with any idea, the second person will accept. Once this runs its course, the roles switch and the second person takes on the job of planning a party. The first person has to say yes to everything and must build on the idea. 
For example, let's have a party on Saturday night. The response might be, yes, and I'll bring a cake. This goes on for a while and the ideas can get wilder. In some cases, the parties end up underwater or on another planet and involve all sorts of exotic food and entertainment. The energy in the room increases, spirits are high, and a huge number of ideas are generated. This is the type of energy that should be present during a great brainstorming session. Of course, at some point you have to decide what is feasible, but that shouldn't happen during the idea generation phase. Brainstorming is about breaking out of conventional approaches to solving a problem. You should feel free to flip ideas upside down, to turn them inside out, and to cut loose from the chains of normalcy. At the end of a brainstorming session, you should be surprised by the range of ideas that were generated. In almost all cases, at least a few will serve as seeds for really great opportunities that are ripe for further exploration. It is important to remember that idea generation involves exploration of the landscape of possibilities. It doesn't cost any money to generate wild ideas and there is no need to commit to any of them. The goal is to break the rules by imagining a world where the laws of nature are different and all constraints are removed. Once this phase is complete, it is appropriate to move on the exploitation phase where you select some of the ideas to explore further. At that time, you can view the ideas with a more critical eye. Rule breaking can happen throughout every organization and all processes. A great example can be found at Coolyris, a young company that creates an immersive web browsing experience. Essentially, Coolyris turns the standard flat web pages we view online into a three-dimensional wall that makes browsing a faster and more intuitive experience. The images stretch out in front of you, making you feel as though you are navigating through a gallery. Two Stanford students, Josh Swartz Apel and Austin Shoemaker, started Coliris with the seasoned entrepreneur Suyenja Bumkar. They received a small amount of funding for their venture, but were having a very difficult time recruiting people to work at the company. This was a big problem. They were never going to reach their aggressive product development goals unless they brought in dozens of talented people. And to make that happen, they were going to have to do things differently. Josh, who was in charge of recruiting, started with all the traditional approaches to recruiting, including posting positions on job boards and crack lists, advertising on social networking sites such as LinkedIn and Facebook, and even hiring professional recruiters. But nothing was working. So the team decided to look at the entire recruiting situation differently and to break with these standard approaches. Instead of trying to convince young, talented people to join the company, they decided to focus on making Colera such an appealing place to work that students would be begging to join. They wanted it to be the coolest party in town. They hosted special events for students, made sure to have the most dramatic booth at the job fairs, complete with eye-popping demos of their product on big plasma screens, and handed out hip sunglasses to everyone who visited their booth. They also hired two Stanford students, Jonah Greenberg and Matt Wall, as interns. Their job was to spread the word about Coolieris across the Stanford campus and to identify the best stu students they could, independent of their age or field of study. Jonah and Matt are popular and well-connected and tapped into their social circles to spread the word about Coolieris. They helped make it cool to work at Coolieris and eventually Coolieris became the place to be. Now that Coolieris was in undated inundated with resumes, how did they decide which students to hire? Instead of going through a rigorous screening process, they decided to not decide and hired almost everyone as interns. This gave them the chance to see each individual in action and for the students to get a taste of the company. Not only did Coliris get an opportunity to take the interns for a test drive, but the interns got so excited about the products that they became evangelists both for the product and the com company, bringing in their friends as interns and as customers. This helped with recruiting and built momentum for the business. 
Now that they were on a roll, colliers continued to break rules. They abolished the hierarchy between interns and full-time employees, giving interns significant projects with full accountability for their results. Each intern was given a project with a big goal and was allowed to do whatever he or she felt would work to reach it. Of course, there was oversight, but the interns were clearly empowered to make key decisions. For example, the goal might be to increase the number of websites that are Colerius enabled. The interns weren't told what to do, but each was encouraged to run with his or her project. In this way, they could easily see what each person could accomplish and reward those who did an outstanding job. But they didn't stop there. They also figured out that the best way to identify those who were a good fit for the company is to see them in action. To do that, they brought in hundreds of students for user testing of their product. This is, of course, standard practice to evaluate new project features, but Colliris also used product testing as a recruiting tool. During the interaction with each tester, they could see how each person thought and how passionate he or she was about the product and ultimately whether he or she would be a good fit with the company. At the very least, they got useful customer feedback and at best, they found a new employee. You might think it's easier to challenge conventions and break rules as an individual or a small, small startup firm, but you can also break the rules that get in the way from within a large company. I learned about the launch of Zoom at Microsoft from a former student, Trisha Lee. This product, designed to complete with the Apple iPod, was on a tight development schedule. About halfway through the project, it was clear they weren't going to meet their aggressive goals. The software wasn't close to halfway complete and on the current course with the usual checks and balances, feedback loops and bureaucracy, it was going to take much longer than expected to complete. To ad address this problem, one of the subgroups on the project isolated themselves from the rest of the team and worked intensely. They completed an essential piece of the software code which got the project back on track, boosted morale, and allowed the product to be completed on time. Companies such as Microsoft put processes in place that are scalable, that is, they have to work for a large groups across a big organization, but sometimes scalable processes are not necessarily efficient. When there is a fire drill and things have to get done quickly, like with Trisha and the Zoom team at Microsoft, companies need to break free of the bureaucracy. In fact, many companies decide to set up Skunk Works projects to do just this. They pull a team out of the normal workflow, giving them permission to break the rules, to free them to think and work differently. Rules are often meant to be broken. This idea is captured in the oft-used phrase, don't ask for permission, but beg for forgiveness. Most rules are in place as the lowest common denominator, making sure that those who don't have a clue what to do stay within the boundaries. If you ask someone how to go about making a movie, starting a company, getting into graduate school, or running for political office, you'll usually get a long recipe that involves getting incrementally more support from those who are already in these fields. It involves agents and seed funding and exams and approvals. The majority of people choose to follow those rules and others don't. It is important to keep in mind that there are often creative ways to work around the rules, to jump over the traditional hurdles and to get to your goal by taking a side route. Just as most people wait in a never-ending line of traffic on the main route to the highway, others who are more adventurous try to find a side road to get to their destination more quickly. Of course, some rules are in place to protect our safety, to keep order, and to create a process that works for a large number of people. But it is worth questioning rules along the way. Sometimes, side roads around the rules can get you to your goal even when the traditional paths appear blocked. Linda Rottenberg, of Endeavor shared a relevant story that had been passed on to her by one of her advisors about two student fighter pilots who got together to share what they had learned from their respective instructors. The first pilot said, 
I was given a thousand rules for flying my plane. The second pilot said, I was only given three rules. The first pilot gloated, thinking he was given many more options until his friend said, my instructor told me the three things I should never do. All else is up to me. This story captures the idea that it is better to know the few things that are really against the rules than to focus on the many things you think you should do. This is also a reminder of the big difference between rules and recommendations. Once you whittle away the recommendations, there are often many fewer rules than you imagined. This is how Linda leads Endeavor. Each franchise is given three things they can't do. The rest is completely up to them. Another way to break the rules is to break free of expectations you have for yourself and that others have for you. Armand Burgicli, a computer scientist, always expected that he would spend his career working for a high technology company. He studied computer science as an undergraduate and management science as a graduate student. After completing school, he took a job as a product manager at a company called Echelon. Everything was going smoothly, he was well respected in the company and his path was set. However, a close friend developed multiple sclerosis. He was so moved by her condition that he wanted to do whatever he could to help. In his free time, after work and on weekends, he built a website called This Is MS. The site offered useful information about MS and its treatments and provided a confidential forum for people with MS to share their experiences. The site quickly gained traction because visitors were hungry for the chance to tell their stories. Armin realized he had struck a nerve. He decided to build an even bigger website that allowed anyone to share his or her experiences anonymously. The new site, called The Experience Project, gained avid users quickly. Armand had to make a tough decision. Should he stay in the secure job with a reliable salary and a clear career path, or jump into the unknown by deciding to run The Experience Project full-time? After serious consideration, Armin decided to break free from the expectations that both he and his family had for him in order to pursue this venture. It was a terribly hard choice, but it has been several years now and Armin doesn't regret his decision for one minute. The business is hard work, but the most challenging part was deciding to completely reinvent himself. So let's step out for the high technology business world and see how you can break rules in order to create something of great value in a completely different arena. The past few years have seen growing interest in restaurants that look at food, cooking and dining in a brand new way. Instead of using traditional cooking techniques, a handful of chefs are experimenting with molecular gastronomy, which involves stretching the limits of cooking in all sorts of unusual directions. These restaurants, Use equipment and materials straight out of a laboratory and play with your senses in wild ways. At Moto in Chicago, the kitchen is stocked with balloons, syringes, and dry eyes, and the goal is to create food that is shocking yet tasty. They have a tasting menu where you actually eat the menu, which might, for example, taste like an Italian panini sandwich. Moto strives to break the rules with each dish they serve from delivering food that looks like packing peanuts to the table in FedEx boxes to making it a dessert that looks like nachos but is really made up of chocolate, frozen shredded mango and cheesecake. Each dish is designed to push the boundary of how you imagine food should look and taste as they transmogrify your food into surprising shapes and forms. One of their chefs, Ben Roche, says their goal is to create a circus for your senses. They question every assumption about food preparation and presentation, develop brand new cooking techniques, and even design custom utensils that are used to consume the food. This is a great reminder that in any arena, from your kitchen to your career, you can break free of the constraints that might be comfortable but are often limiting. I met with a dozen current and former students and asked them to share their stories about breaking free from expectations. After listening to all their tales about getting around obstacles in school, in the workplace, and when traveling, Mike Rotenberg, who graduated two years ago, summarized all he heard by stating, 
all the cool stuff happens when you do things that are not the automatic next step. The well-worn path is there for everyone to trample, but the interesting things often occur when you are open to taking an unexpected turn. To trying something different and when you are willing to question the rules others have made for you, all agreed that it is easy to stay on the prescribed path, but it is often much more interesting to discover the world of surprises lurking just around the corner. Knowing that you can question the rules is terrifically empowering. It is a reminder that the traditional path is only one option available to you. You can always follow a recipe, drive on the major thoroughfares, and walk in the footsteps of those before you. But there are boundless additional options to explore if you are willing to identify and challenge assumptions and to break free of the expectations that you and others project onto you. Don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Read in a swimming pool. To have a healthy disregard for the impossible and to turn well-worn ideas on their heads. As the students described above learned, it takes practice to do things that are not the automatic next step. The more you experiment, the more you see that the spectrum of options is much broader than imagined. The sole rule is that you are limited only by your energy and your imagination. Have a great day, and let me show you how this looks like sitting in an empty pool. It was fun. I hope you liked it. Have a great day. Bye.